Welcome, everybody. So today we're going to be talking about graphic design for public administrators, um, which you all are. If you're working with the public sector, the nonprofit sector, that's what you do. Um, <clears throat> but one of the fascinating things about this uh, workshop was I was not expecting the response that we got. And I don't know if the Georgia Policy Lab people were either, because um, you all had to like, use a wait list to get into this afternoon session because there was so much demand for this session. Um, um, so this is like round two. And so what I want to do first, just to, to get started here, um, I'm really curious about why there was so much interest in, in this, um, in this topic. So what I want you to do is in the chat, um, go ahead and answer these questions. Like, why did you choose to sign up for this and, and join the wait list? Like, why, why is this so interesting to you all? And then um, the second question here, where do you use design in your job? I doubt any of you are like full-time graphic designers put on staff to design stuff. You all have other jobs. Um, you research, you write, you do grant writing, you do a whole bunch of other things, um, but you're interested in graphic design. So where do you do design in your job? So go ahead and in the chat, um, we'll take a minute or so and we'll see what people say. So head on to the chat and tell everybody what you're doing here. Cool, so I'm liking the responses here. Um, there's some common themes here where you care about communication. Um, there's something about well-designed objects, whether it be slide decks or videos or reports or annual reports or whatever, um, that somehow makes things more engaging. And you all recognize that. Like if you're just typing something in Word in 12 point times New Roman and you hand that out to your stakeholders or hand that out to your donors, nobody's gonna care because um, it's like ugly. Um, but there's there's a reason for them not caring. And we'll talk about that in a minute, kind of the philosophy behind why we should care about designing stuff. Um, and even though none of you are full-time graphic designers, as you mentioned in the chat here, you all do things with design. You have to maintain your department's website. You have to create videos. You have to do lots of slide decks. You have to do lots of reports. Um, so you're constantly designing stuff. You're constantly creating stuff. Um, but um, in some of your cases, you're 100% self-taught about like how to make things look good. You might not have the tools to know why something looks good or why something looks bad. Um, so the goal for today is to basically, one, convince you that designing is important, which I think we're already done. You're here, so you're convinced. Um, and two, to give you a set of tools that you can apply to any situation where there's something that is designed, whether it be something on like printed, like a, a book or a document or an article or a flyer, um, the same principles apply to video, the same principles apply to audio, even though that's not a visual medium, the same things even apply to like architecture and art. Um, these core principles that you'll be learning today um, apply everywhere. And once you see them in once once you learn about them today, you'll see it all over the world. And it's like the secret code that you just learned. And it, it's really exciting stuff. Um, so we move on really quick in this little introduction here. Everything you make is designed, even if you don't intend it to be. If you're just writing a couple of paragraphs as part of a grant application, that's the raw text, but eventually that's going to transform into something else that is a design thing. Um, and it ranges from, from all over the, the spectrum here. You have memos and reports and research and data visualizations and tables. That's kind of your, your normal day-to-day -day professional stuff. Um, you'll, off, you'll also often have to um, advertise events for your, for your different organizations, um, advertise, like make advertisements, posters, announcements, flyers, um, walk through any building um, with like a bulletin board at a like university campus and you'll see a billion different little pieces of paper with flyers advertising stuff. Um, and so like you're creating those things. You can even get the, into the super mundane thing here where like the signs outside your office, like you, your name sign or like a sign on the fridge that says like empty this out by Friday because we're cleaning it out. Um, those can, those are designed objects. Often we just go for the super simple thing, like clean out the fridge on Friday and make it like super big in Calibri and Word and print that out and have it be centered. That's boring. Um, you can spend like two more minutes to make it look cool and, and artsy and, and well-designed. 
Um, I don't know if that's necessarily going to make people like empty the fridge faster because they'll pay attention to the design, but it will be different from like a boring centered 72 point Calibri thing. Um, and so you're constantly designing stuff. Um, and so you might as well do it well. Um, design is also, um, as we mentioned in the chat here, it enhances communication. There's something almost magical about it that makes it so people pay attention um, and, and, and get the message better. There was a, a cool randomized control trial 10 years ago um, where these researchers wanted to see if design mattered for like grades. And so they had some student papers that were identical. They just had one B in like Times New Roman and one B in a slightly smaller Garamond font, like 11 point Garamond. And they had a whole bunch of professors grade these and the people like the papers that were in Garamond had a higher average grade than the Times New Roman ones, um, simply because it looked better. So there's a cheat code for life. Um, if you want good grades, make stuff look good. And then people look at the design, they're like, ah, oh, obviously they know what they're talking about. Um, so hopefully you do know what you're talking about, not just like faking it through design, um, but it does help with communication um, and makes things appear more credible. And we'll talk about kind of the, the philosophical reasons for that. But one reason is that it takes the audience's needs into account. And so whatever message you're trying to communicate will inherently match what the audience needs, hopefully, if you've designed it well which means they will naturally understand it better because it's catering to what they need to understand. Um, so that's a good thing. Um, it also exudes professionalism. Um, people will like believe it more. That's the whole Garamond idea um, or making the fridge sign be all fancy and modern instead of 72 point Calibri. Um, and then finally, good design is fun. Um, Part of the reason I fell into this, this world of design like 15 years ago was because I was procrastinating and was just like changing fonts. And then I was like, hey, this is fun. And so then I started looking up how to do things even more professionally. And then I was like, how do people make books? And so I started looking into book design and I started taking classes in it. And now I'm here. Um, so it, it, it's fun and it, it's kind of addicting as you start getting into it, where you start seeing design everywhere and you want to start throwing everything at it. Um, which is kind of fun. Um, so my background for this, um, like why is a professor of nonprofit management and statistics and economics um, talking to you all about like art and design? Um, my background is I, I majored as an undergraduate in Italian literature and Arabic and had no background whatsoever in anything quantitative. Um, my goal was to go get a PhD in history and be a history professor and, and do stuff like that. But then the recession happened in like 2010 and all my plans died um, because of that. And so I ended up getting an MPA, um, not even knowing what that was, um, but knowing that it was important for like working for the State Department or USAID, because I wanted to go to the Middle East and do stuff like that. Um, and, but as I was doing my MPA, um, I realized that I still wanted to keep doing the design stuff that I had been doing as an undergrad, um, where as an undergrad, I was doing lots of academic print design, like book design and article design, lots of web development stuff. Um, and so I started incorporating that into my own like regular policy research type stuff because of my background. Um, so like this print design stuff, for instance, we were like, I did this book here, but it's the side-by-side -side translation of this is an Arabic translation of some medieval Greek text. I have no clue what it's about, but I was in charge of making it look pretty. So that's that was my job. I have no clue what this was. Some philosophical text about medicine or something. Um, I still do um, book design and graphic design. This is from a book I did for some nonprofit press recently um, where like I, I still dabble in this stuff. Um, and the fun thing is, is that even though like I have this background in design and humanities and, and, and literature and all of that stuff, but it has informed um, the research and the approach I take now. Um, so design is still part of my research process. Um, this is probably like super nerdy and extra, but like every research project I start, um, like the first half hour of doing the research project and considering it, I go and find a color palette that I want to use throughout the research. I find good contrasting fonts that I want to use. I kind of make a style guide for the project, um, which is, yeah, probably too much, but it's fun. And so like every one of my projects has like a distinctive visual um, fingerprint, I guess. I do the same thing for my classes, for the former students here. 
Um, I have like every class has its own color scheme and a logo that goes with it. Super, super nerdy there, but like it, it looks good. Um, it's better than like a boring syllabus. So that's what I do. Um, and you can all do that too, because this design stuff is fun again, and it helps with communication. So the plan for today, for the next couple hours here, um, we're going to start off talking a little bit philosophically again about why we should care about this. Um, this is also to help you defend yourself in the future when people say, quit formatting this stuff, just give me an ugly document because nobody cares about design. People care about design and we have all sorts of philosophy explaining why. Um, and so we'll talk about that. Then the important part is this section here where I will give you a toolkit for creating beautiful things, creating well-designed things correctly. Um, for those of you who are self-taught and you just are kind of stumbling into this, this is kind of your foundation, a framework that helps you organize critiques of designs and your own process for designing stuff. Um, so it's really cool, really powerful and easy to remember. It's a memorable acronym we will come up with. And then for the last half of the, the workshop, we're going to practice using these tools. Um, in little workout or uh, breakout sessions, um, I will have you redesign an ugly flyer using Canva, which is a free online software that lets you design stuff. Um, and then you'll also get to play around with designing text in Word, because most of you do writing in Word or Google, or Google Docs or some sort of um, uh, word processing software. You can still make beautiful designs even without like fancy Adobe tools or with Canva. You can do it with Word. And so I'll give you the tools to do that as well, which should be fun and exciting. Um, finally, all of the materials for this workshop, all of the slides, all of the examples that we'll be doing, um, all of the different design pieces that you'll be using when you redesign flyers, everything is at this website here, which I'll also put in the chat here. Um, it's just a, a standalone little website that has all the materials you'll need. It also has a whole bunch of other resources like links to um, websites where you can download fonts, where you can find good combinations of colors. Um, you can find stock images and stock photography and a whole bunch of other stuff. So um, bookmark this thing. It's a hopefully will be a good resource for you. So it should be in the chat now. If you want to just click on that, <clears throat> it should take you to where you need to be. So with that introduction, we will start talking about the philosophy of design really quick. Um, so while I bring that <clears throat> while I bring that up, if you have any questions, put them in the chat and we'll answer them. Any comments, any whatevers, um, while I pull this up, I have to rearrange screens and stuff. So feel free to ask whatever questions you have while I pull this thing up. Okay, so Erin in the chat says she's interested in working within brand guidelines set by the university. Um, yes, we will talk about that um, because often you, you, you are somewhat constrained by um, specific templates sometimes, um, but often those templates are created by professional designers. And what I've seen often in like lots of academic presentations is people use the, um, the university or, or think tank provided template um, for PowerPoint, but then all of the text is just like the default colors and Calibri and just normal default fonts while the rest of the template is like well-designed. And so I'll show you like how to match those um, and use the same fonts and make it feel like it's part of the same template. Um, so yeah, you it is definitely possible. And we will mention that when we get to the word section. So good question. Okay. So let's briefly talk about why people care about beauty in things and what the relationship is between truth and beauty, which is kind of a, a strange relationship here. So one of the most common um, questions or pieces of feedback I get for, from people who have never done any sort of artsy humanities design type stuff is stuff like this. Um, especially this comment right here. You'll hear this a lot. Like, I don't need to waste time with design. 
my data and findings will speak for themselves. And so the, the point here is you just write the paper, do whatever default colors come out of Stata or R or SPSS or whatever you're using, and whatever truth you have found and discovered in your research will just speak for itself because it's there in text, um, which fine. But as we'll see, like there are better ways of communicating that and the data and findings don't necessarily speak for themselves. They need some other aspect behind them in order to get that that information communicated to some audience. Um, other things like Avatar here, the movie with the blue aliens from like 15 years ago or whatever. Um, for whatever reason, they chose to use Papyrus, this ugly font, as the, the closed captioning font um, whenever aliens spoke. That was like how it was translated. And people made fun of it because one, it's kind of an ugly font, but two, it's hard to read, especially on screen when it's like yellow. Um, so like, but if you don't understand typography, then you just throw whatever font you want. And Comic Sans, yay, that's great. Um, so we should care about this stuff though, because um, my main argument here is that good design enhances truth and enhances people's understanding of truth. Just having text is fine. There's something in there, but without being able to communicate that something to other people, they're not going to understand it and they're not going to act. They're not going to change. There's not going to be kind of an adoption of new truth or anything like that. You need something behind that to kind of convey that truth to an audience. Um, so briefly, what is this truth stuff? Um, the tricky part here is like philosophers have been or, or arguing about this for thousands of years. What is truth? Um, there's lots of different types of truth out there. One is this idea of like core principles of the universe. Gravity is truth, I guess. Um, gravity is this universal constant or universal constant that works all over the place. That's why we're standing on a planet right now. Like gravity is a thing. Um, so it's a truth. Um, underlying trends in society, those can be truths. If you're doing any sort of policy research, like the Georgia Policy Lab here um, researches um, uh, poverty and precarity, um, and so there might be research about um, whether or not a specific public program like Medicaid or WIC um, helps uh, improve child poverty or decrease the, the negative effects that come from childhood poverty. And so you'll do all sorts of cool research and stats and you'll find some sort of treatment effect, an average treatment effect maybe through causal inference. And you'll have a specific number. That could be truth. Like you could say this program causes some reduction in childhood poverty, therefore we should roll it out. This is the truth that we have discovered through this research. That is a fully valid truth. Um, truth can also be something transcendental. Um, if you're hiking in the mountains and you see a sunrise, there's some feeling that you get from watching that happen and some sort of underlying truth about what nature is. That's a completely different truth from like gravity or the effect of Medicaid on childhood poverty, but it's still something truthy there. Um, reality, like what you can see with your eyes, that could be considered truth. But again, everybody has different perceptions of that. Um, so it, it's lots of things. Um, so how do we find out what this truth stuff is? Um, this is also tricky. There's no one way to discover these things. Um, often people like to rely on this, this avenue for finding truth, this idea of science. Um, so this guy here, Neil deGrasse Tyson, he's a astro astronomer, not astrologer, astronomer, um, who has a PhD in astronomy. He's all over like um, TV shows about nature and science and stuff. And he has a big Twitter presence, but often he has these statements here and says like, the good thing about science is that it's true, whether or not you believe in it. And that science is the only way to discover truth about anything. Um, he'll often on Twitter criticize movies for not being scientifically accurate, therefore um, not good. And he's kind of a curmudgeon sometimes. Um, but while this is good and we learn about the scientific method in elementary school, like create hypotheses, test hypotheses, whatever comes out of that scientific process machine is therefore truth. Um, that's an overly simplistic way of looking at how we find truth. It's not the only way. Um, this is something called scientism where science is the only objective means by which society should determine values of stuff. And so if we live in a world of scientism, 
then science is the only way to determine if something is good. So gravity only exists because science has discovered it. Medicaid only exists because it is evidence-based and that's the only way we can understand, like that's the only way we can implement policy. Um, if all policies had to be evidence-based from the start, we'd have very few policies. Lots of policies are just kind of experimental and not necessarily based on science at the beginning. Transcendental feelings of like looking at a sunset or a sunrise, there's maybe science there, like certain colors activate endorphins in your head or something. I don't know. But there are other like there are other avenues for discovering truth beyond just raw science. For instance, um, you can rely on art and music and literature. Religion offers truth. Nature offers truth. And the interesting thing about these avenues for truth is that often these are not connected to fact. Um, gravity is a fact, sure. But here, for instance, this little girl comes from a French novel from the 1800s named Les Miserables which has like a super famous uh, musical about it. And there's been all sorts of film adaptations about it. It's kind of entered American popular culture as the story about like injustice um, and how like emphasizing the plight of the poor. Um, Cosette was not a real person. She never existed. Nobody in that book ever existed. Um, Jean Valjean, the main character who stole bread and was imprisoned for 19 years was not a person. And so if you're Neil deGrasse Tyson, you say, well, we can discount that because it's fake and it's not based on reality. But it still teaches truth. Um, it teaches truth about human nature. It teaches truth about how we should reform justice systems um, and, and incarceration and other things like that. Um, we can learn that from this book, which is not factual. Um, King Lear, it's a Shakespeare play. Lear was never a real person. None of his kids were real people, but we still learn important truths about human nature um, and senility and give your kingdom to angry or something. Um, there's, there's truth in that. Beethoven's Ninth Symphony has the like, notes, um, sure, but there's also something like transcendental about hearing it. Um, when the Berlin Wall fell, there was like a unity concert in 1989, 1990, where they played the song between the two Germanys. And it was like this huge emotional experience, not because of factual things that were happening in the music, but because of something larger. And so you can pursue truth, even if it's not connected to fact. Um, so this, this claim right here is kind of scary, but also true here. Just because something is factual does not make it truth. And just because something is truthful does not necessarily mean that it's factual. Um, they're not necessarily connected. So if that's the case, where does truth come from if you're living in a world with no facts? If you're trying to find truth in art or in literature, um, where does the truth come from there? And my argument here is that it comes from this idea of beauty. And it's not my, my idea. I'm not making this up. This is like um, Aristotelian ethics and philosophy from like 2,000, 3,000 years ago. Like this is not super revolutionary. Um, this idea comes from this idea of rhetoric, which if you took English classes back as an undergraduate, um, it, there's this, this idea that all, all created objects, whether it be texts or art or whatever, have something called a content and have something called a form, which has lots of different names throughout time. This is logos and Lexis, if you remember from English, if you were an English major. Um, where the content is kind of the nugget of truth itself. So in Les Miserables, this is like, we should care about human justice. That is the core content. The form is how that content is then communicated to people so that an audience can understand that core nugget of truth. Um, if you are doing a research project, find the, finding the average treatment effect of Medicaid on poverty, the content there is that average treatment effect, that's your number. You have content. The form though matters substantially. You can't just throw raw content at people. They won't understand it. Jean Valjean or Victor Hugo, the author of Les Miserables could have just written an essay saying, be nice to criminals and don't put people in jail because they steal bread. That's the core, that's the essence. He could have just written that and published it, but it wouldn't have 
long staying power like it has had. Um, the reason it does is because it has a specific structure and form and beauty to it. And that is what makes things um, more convincing and more um, long lasting. So beauty matters, even for things like average treatment effects of Medicaid. Um, so in general, combining these two things is where we find truth. So we, we have the form or this art, and that's how we translate that content to different audiences so they can understand it. Um, so in the end here, truth comes from this combination of content and form in a way that makes it so that it feels good, it feels right, it feels accessible, we like it because of that marriage between content and form. So even if you have raw facts and you just have a table or you have a regression output, you can't just throw that at people because it's missing the form, missing the beauty. Um, and so you need that beauty here. So in conclusion for this little section here, basically, Beauty shapes the form of the stuff that we are are creating and communicating. So we need to understand how to create this beauty. Otherwise, we're just going to be throwing regression tables at people and nobody cares about those. Um, so how do we do that? That is the next little section here. So while I switch, if you have any questions, um, feel free to put that in the chat while I bring up the next little section about how to create this beauty stuff and start giving you your toolkit for communicating better, which is why you are here. Okay, no questions. I'm assuming you're all 100% convinced and philosophically interested in beauty now. So good, I've converted you all. Or you're just like shaking your head and saying, ah, no facts are just facts. Um, no facts have to be beautiful. That's one big takeaway from this thing. All right, but how do we create this beauty and how do you know if something is beautiful, how do you recognize it? That is what we're going to talk about now. So how do we create this stuff? How do we make sure the content matches the, or the form matches the content and the form fits with what audiences need and is convincing to audiences? Um, in general, there are some core principles that you can follow um, that makes it so that you can understand if something is beautiful or not, and so that you can create beautiful things by following these principles here, which then ultimately lets you communicate truth, um, which is your goal as public administrators and public policy researchers. That's what we want to do. Um, so the neat thing about this is that these principles are fairly universal and they are learnable. This is one of the, the coolest things about this is you do not have to be an artist to incorporate these principles here. Um, and that's important because I myself am not an artist. Um, I, my kids still laugh at like my dumb stick figures when I draw with them because they're just ridiculous. Um, I, if I try to like add clothes to them, it, it's so good. I, I just draw the stick and then I draw the shirt and erase the stick in the middle and it, it's miserable. Um, but even then, like you, you don't necessarily need to be an artist. You don't have to have an inborn knack for understanding design and art and appreciating it. Um, you can learn specific principles and then become a better designer and a better recognizer of kind of these artistic principles. Um, and so that's my promise to all of you. If you think that you're just like more of a mathy person or more of a, a words person and you don't understand how this visual stuff works, you can understand it, and I promise that. I've never had a student not understand this stuff um, because these principles are universal. And again, I'm not inventing this stuff. These are not like the four principles that I have discovered in presenting to you. Um, there have been thousands of um, books and articles written over thousands of years about what makes something look good. Um, that's You can get a PhD in art history or whatever, and like there are experts out there in this stuff. Um, so rather than making you read all thousands of these books over centuries, um, we're going to distill these principles into four. Um, and that's all. And they make a convenient acronym for you, um, which is C-R-A-P or CRAP, um, which is great because you want your, basically you want your design to look like CRAP here. So these, these four principles here um, are an acronym that stand for Contrast, Repetition, Alignment, and Proximity. 
Um, and we'll talk about each of these principles in detail in just a minute here. Um, but the reason this is cool is that it is basically a checklist that you can go through. So anytime you see some sort of a designed object, whether it be a flyer or a book or an article or a movie or whatever, you can start running through this checklist and say, how does this flyer do with contrast? Is there a lot of contrast in it? Is the contrast weak? What could be improved? How does it do with repetition? Look for the different repeated elements. How does it do with alignment? How does it do with proximity? Um, and it, it essentially gives you a language and a vocabulary for talking about design and for recognizing things that are done well and things that are done poorly. Um, this comes from this book here. It's called The Non-Designer's Design Book um, by Robin Williams. This is not the actor. Um, she's a graphic designer who's been teaching graphic design for decades. Um, when I taught graphic design classes, this was the textbook we used. It is like, I have this thing here that says your life will change forever. Um, that's almost not an exaggeration. I've had like, it, it's a super accessible book. It introduces these contrast repetition, repetition alignment proximity principles and shows how to implement them in lots of detail. Um, and once you understand this, like your basic designs, like here's a flyer for an event on Friday will increase like substantially and improve substantially. Um, I've had students um, who were just like, they had regular jobs doing like analysis or just stuff in their jobs. And then they decided they went through this book and then started creating new um, new design things like flyers and, and uh, Instagram images and Facebook images and stuff. And then they've been like promoted to PR and um, now they're doing all sorts of like really cool stuff um, because they understand design principles, even though they're not like formally trained graphic designers. Like the, the principles here are super easy to catch on and they give you a lot to work with um, and get you like 99% of the way there when you're creating cool stuff. So that's what we're talking about here, these four principles. So we're gonna start with C or contrast. So what contrast means is that you want items on the page or on in the object to either be identical or make them very different and to not be wimpy about making them different. And we'll show a whole bunch of examples of this. Um, and so there's, there's lots of ways that you can incorporate contrast into designed objects. Um, one really easy way is through fonts. You can have something called typographic contrast. Um, with fonts, you can mix and match different families of fonts. So you may have noticed this just over time as you're doing, uh, as you're changing fonts in Word. That was like one of the first things I remember back when I was like eight and we got Word and I was like, oh, I can make this curly and I can make this like comic booky. That's awesome, um, which is fun. But there's actually like a whole world of, of font design and typography. You can get a PhD in font design if you want. Um, which I would never do that. Um, but there are specific characteristics of different fonts that let you kind of sort them into broader categories. Um, and so it's mostly based on the shape of the letter forms here. So if you look at the P here in Sphinx, if you look at the very bottom of the P, there's kind of a, a, almost like a foot, a little flourishes that come off of the P. Those are called serifs. Um, I think they, they come from like the days of calligraphy where as you're writing, you'd sometimes get little flourishes coming off of letter forms. And so then when they invented the, like the printing press, they kind of borrowed those same flourishes and, and adapted them to, to printing. Um, so if you look at all of these different letter forms, the F here has kind of a, a, a big lump at the end here. It also has a little foot thing. The X has little feet things. The I has a little hook coming off of it. So all of those extra additions to the letter forms here are called serifs. Um, there's all sorts of research that shows that like, those serifs generally help with reading. Um, they help guide your eye across the word uh, because it's kind of like acrobatically flowing into the next letter. Um, and so it, it works well for lots of body text. This is why most books that you read, if you go pull a book off your shelf right now, it's most likely going to be in a serif font. Um, because that's just kind of the standard thing for print design specifically is, is serif font. Um, you'll often see in, in other websites about graphic design, it'll say, don't ever use serif fonts on a screen, like on a computer screen. 
um, because the serifs won't necessarily appear. That was the case in like the 1990s and early 2000s when computer monitors were not very high resolution. You, like these serifs would just turn into kind of like blocky chunks. Um, but nowadays with like high resolution monitors, your phone has incredibly high resolution screen. Um, iPads are incredible. Like you can see all the serifs. And so serif text on a screen is fine. Um, you can disregard the blog posts out there that say, don't ever do it. Like it works. Um, sans serif fonts are a different family of fonts. And if you know French, sans, or we say that in American English, sans, I think in French it's like sans or something. Yeah, that means without. And so if you look at the letter forms here, there are no serifs. If you look at the bottom of the P, it just ends in a rectangle there. The top of the F just ends in a solid rectangle. There are no little flourishes here. It's just without any serifs. Um, often, most often you'll see things like sans serif in titles or in headings and subheadings or in table text or in figures. Um, data visualization has lots of um, sans serif text. Um, there, there's debates about whether or not you should have your body text be sans serif because it doesn't have the serifs, which help with reading. Um, but people are still good at reading sans serif text um, in general. And so you can, you can do that for body text too. Um, slab serif fonts are like super serifs. Um, so if you imagine like wanted signs from the late 1800s in the wild west in the US, that's kind of a slab serif idea where you just have, you still have the serifs, but instead of being little flourishes, it's just like giant rectangles at the bottom of the P, just very, very chunky. Um, and so that's what slab serif is. These others, you have script fonts that look like handwriting, I guess. You have decorative fonts like curls and like papyrus and comic sans. You have monospaced fonts um, that look like computer code. And the reason they're called monospaced fonts um, is because every one of these letters is the same width. Even if it's like this I is technically a skinny letter, but it is the same width as the N and the S. That's not the case with all of these others. If you highlight like this I right there, that's narrow with the highlighting. If I highlight the X, that's a lot wider. And the space in between the words is fairly skinny. And that's because it, it makes sense to our eyes to have like skinny letters take up less room. Um, monospaced fonts don't though. It's the same width all the way through. Even spaces have the same width. And the reason for that is it helps you align the text. This is why programming languages, like if you have, if you're doing any sort of programming, it's going to be with a monospaced font. Because then if you go like to the next line and you want to have three characters, the third character is going to be right under the H of Sphinx. And so it basically makes like rid of sorts where you have columns and rows in code because the font all has the same width. As far as like using this in a design, you don't necessarily want to do that. That's harder to read. Um, you wouldn't want to read a whole book like this. We did back in like typewriter days, I guess, but we're not in typewriter days. So don't do that. Um, so the way contrast works with this is if you want to take a flyer or some sort of document and add typographic contrast, you can mix and match different type families. You can choose a serif font and a sans serif font and mix them because they're different enough that it provides pretty strong contrast. You can have the headings be sans serif and the body text be serif. Um, you can do script and serif. You can have your, your headings be this fancy scripty font or have the title be scripty and then have a serif font for the rest of it. You can use big chunky slab serif things for headings and then sans serif for the text. That would look cool. Um, basically, you just choose a font from any of these families, mix it with another font from one of the families, and it should look pretty good. Um, you don't generally want to choose fonts from the same family because of contrast. You don't want to have your headings be Times New Roman and your body text be Palatino or Garamond, for instance, because those look super similar and it looks more like you made a mistake than you were trying to do it on purpose. Um, for instance, if you look at this right here, these are two different serif fonts. Um, the same size, um, one is a slightly different font. You can tell if you look at the A, it's kind of steeper with that, that curl at the top of the A, this is rounder. So there are two different serif fonts, but that really just looks like a, a mistake. So if you want to have better typographic contrast, mix and match the families. 
So here is a slab serif heading with sans serif text. And that is legal because it's, they're different families, um, but it provides some good, strong contrast there. And that looks better than this over here. Um, and so that's one way of, of adding contrast into things through typography. Um, you can also um, use other elements of a font. Um, lots of more modern fonts nowadays. You don't see this in Word, uh, mostly because like Calibri is just like one size. Um, you have like bold and italic and regular. Um, but there are other fonts out there that have all sorts of um, different sizes within the same family. So this is all the same font. I think this is Roboto or something, um, where it ranges from extra light to black. So if you want your document or your designed object to only have one font, that's fine as long as you have contrast in there. So you might have the text be light and the headings be black or bold and extra light or bold and regular. Um, some combination of these, of these different weights should add some good contrast. You don't want to be wimpy about the contrast and maybe have the text be light and the headings be regular. That's not strong contrast and it'll look like a mistake instead. So if you look here, for instance, this is light, this is regular and there's not a lot of contrast there. But if instead you do this, make this super light and make this bold, um, there's strong contrast there and it looks a lot better um, because it's following the, the graphic design principle of contrast. You can also do contrast with size, um, which you can have huge text, you can have tiny text. Um, this is important, especially with like headings. If you have a document that has headings and subheadings, you probably don't want the body text to be 12 point font and the headings to be 13 point font because that's not a lot of contrast. It's going to look like a mistake. Uh, it's going to look like you forgot to change one of the font sizes. Um, but what you could do instead is if you made the body text like 11 points, which is normal, the whole idea of having 12 point font that you always do in Word, that's the default in Word, um, pretty much no published print thing. If you look at any books on yourself, um, or any journal article or anything, nobody uses 12 point font, that's too big. Um, most printed things use between 10 and 11 points. Um, so if you're doing something, you can shrink the body text to like 10 and a half or 11, and then make the headings be like 14 or 15. And then that gives you better, stronger contrast between the two levels of text with headings and text or headings in the body text. And that helps with contrast and it feels better. Um, so you can do all sorts of stuff just with fonts and just with your text to add contrast. Um, you can also add contrast with color. Um, if you remember from like your elementary school days, there were color wheels that you played with and there's primary colors and secondary colors and complementary colors, and all sorts of things. Um, this is all based on science. You can get a PhD in color theory and be a color theoretician professionally. Um, which needs to go do that, um, invent new colors or something, um, where like there are specific colors that are kind of paired with contrasts be based on the color wheel here. So this, this light blue here, there are contrasting colors and complementary colors, this orange and this yellow, this green kind of fits with the triad if you're trying to, to look at a complementary and, and matching colors that way. Um, Color theory is tricky, um, mostly because we don't, we generally don't have an intuitive understanding about how the color wheel works. I don't. Um, I've been doing this for like 15 years and I still like just guess with colors. And so one really cool tool that exists is um, Adobe has a thing called Adobe Color, um, which is a separate website. It's free. You can go ahead and go to color.adobe.com if you want to see what this looks like. So let me show you what this lets you do. So what it lets you do is like this, this triangle right here, that is kind of the base color for this palette. And so I can drag it around and let's say I want my corporate color, for instance, like in the logo of my organization, we have this red and we have to use that red because that's what the corporate people say to do. Um, but I want good contrasting colors that work well with that red. So what I could do is change these different harmony rules. So right now it's using this analogous rule. So it's choosing similar colors based on color wheel physics. Um, but then I can switch it to monochromatic. So this gives you different shades of that red. 
So maybe I could use this light red and this dark red, and that adds contrast, or this super dark red and that red, that adds some contrast. I could do a triad of colors. And so there's the corporate red, but then there's a good contrasting blue and a good slightly darker red and a good bright yellow. Like all of those fit based on physics and, and light and how it works um, for creating good contrasting colors. You can create complementary colors. You can do split complementary colors, double split complementary colors. So there's a good, that's kind of an ugly palette. I don't like any of those colors except the red. So you can actually adjust, you can kind of drag this around. Um, you can drag specific ones around. If you go to custom, you can just move one. So if I don't like this green, I can kind of fudge it and say, I want a different green and it, it's close enough. So there's all sorts of cool tools here for doing that. There's also this cool thing where you can click on extract theme. And if you upload a picture, for instance, this picture of um, Atlanta, it uses fancy algorithms to determine kind of the five most important contrasting colors in the picture. So if you were in charge of making some sort of design based on Atlanta and your organization said, use the stock image, upload the stock image here, see what colors it spits out and then use those or adjust them. You can move them around a little bit if you don't like the ones they gave you. Um, and now you have a cool palette, specifically like it feels like nighttime Atlanta, which is neat. The another cool thing that Adobe Color has is accessibility tools, which is really important um, because 8% of the population or 8% of males, only 1% of females um, have some form of colorblindness. And the most common one is red green colorblindness. It's called deuteranopia. And so what you want to do is make sure that the colors you choose are also visible to people who have colorblindness. Um, and so if you use this accessibility tool, that was our cool Atlanta palette that we found, but it gives us a warning here. It says color B and C are too similar. Um, and so it's not going to be accessible if we're trying to do contrast between those two blues, some portion of the population is not going to be able to see it. And if you scroll down here, it actually simulates what these colors would look like to people with deuteranopia or protonopia or tritonopia, which are different forms of color blindness. And it gives you warnings about like what works and what doesn't. So like red green color blindness is super common. So if we move green out here, I don't know what those white lines are. That's pretty neat. Um, it's gonna warn us like C and D are too conflicted um, because look at somebody who has protonopia, those two colors are basically identical um, to them. And so you want to make sure the color palette that you choose or the colors that you use in the design kind of fit accessibility standards. If you work for the federal government, you this is often a step for any public facing um, document that you create that has to go through kind of a regulatory process where you check and make sure all the colors are accessible to a wide range of different types of color blindness. Um, and Adobe Color helps you with that. Um, they also have like trending palettes. You can save palettes that you've created. Um, people can borrow the palettes. This is like Facebook for colors, I guess, which is neat. So here's a whole bunch of palettes people have made. Beautiful. And like corresponding pictures. Great. You can see which ones are trending too, like on Instagram. Great. So Adobe Color is cool. Um, I'd recommend you just play around with it. Check it out. It's a fun little tool that you can use specifically to create contrast and to um, choose good colors that create good, strong contrast. Um, and it's not just to make things look nice. It's also um, to improve the usability of things and the accessibility of things. So we already talked about colorblind safe colors. Um, there's this idea here of having perceptually uniform colors, especially when you're presenting data. If you're doing any sort of data visualization, you want the, the data that you encode in your colors. Like if you have a survey with five different responses, like strongly disagree, disagree, neutral, agree, strongly agree. Like those are, are five different things. You probably want the colors that you map onto those, those bars if you're doing a bar chart to also encode some information. So you want the distance between strongly disagree and, uh, and disagree to be the same color distance that it is from disagree to neutral um, and from neutral to strongly agree. Um, or a, up that whole range. And so there are tools that help you with this. Um, so 
often we love using rainbow colors in data visualization because rainbows are neat. We like them. Um, but the issue with using rainbows is if you if you have this five category chart um, and you choose red and then purple and then blue and then green and then yellow as your colors, because those are good standard colors, look at the distance between them on this prism here. So red going from red to purple is kind of a short distance going from purple to blue gets a little bit longer blue to green is a huge jump green to yellow is a medium jump and so um we have five different colors but they're not perceptually uniform across that whole spectrum they have different chunks to it and so it it hurts the interpretation of it um subliminally almost like we can't see the same distance between things um, there are palettes that help with this, though. If you go to Google and search for Viridis, V-I-R-I-D-I-S, this is a special palette that super smart people have invented that is perceptually uniform. And so if you choose like five colors from the Viridis palette, it's going to choose like this color and then the same distance and then the same distance and the same distance. It's going to cut this whole spectrum up into five chunks and it'll it'll look nice and it'll feel better. Um, and it'll help with the interpretation of different graphs. Um, there, you're not limited to just this this green one. They have a whole bunch of other ones. Like magma is a is one of the Viridis palettes. Plasma is one of them. They've got like eight different ones that are all perceptually uniform, and so it helps um, show the data better. And I'll show a picture of that in just a minute. The other neat thing about perceptually uniform colors is that they're generally colorblind friendly. So this rainbow palette. Notice how it starts here with yellow and then it goes blue and then the rest of it's basically yellow. And so if you cut this up into five chunks, you have yellow, blue, light blue, yellow, 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 like that, that's not helpful. Um, but if you look at Viridis, if it's for somebody with deuteranopia, it goes consistently from yellow to blue here. So if you cut that up into five chunks, the colors that you get there are going to be distinct. And it's going to be easier to understand regardless of, of how people perceive color. So an example of this, here's a map of Georgia. These are all the different counties in Georgia colored by how big the counties are. So filled by area. So the larger counties are these bluer ones, I guess, in purple. Um, but it's really hard to see kind of the gradation between small and large. Like, first of all, red seems like it should be bigger, maybe. Like maybe those scales should be reversed, but it's hard to see like, is there like a consistent gradient here? If you use Viridis, on the other hand, it goes from super dark to super light, but also blue through the greens up to yellow. And so that is easier to see. Like if you just blur your eyes here, this just looks like a, a hodgepodge of color. This over here, you can see there's darker areas and lighter areas and your eye can kind of follow that, uh, follow that scale. Um, this is another one of the Viridis scales. It's called the plasma palette. It's the same idea. Instead of using green and, and yellow, it uses like purplish and orange and it looks cool. So again, like blur your eyes and you can see the patterns a lot easier than this blob of a rainbow. Um, so, Color is a huge, huge field in this whole world of art and design. Rely on Adobe Color for lots of the stuff that you do because it, it's a really well-made tool. Um, if you're doing any sort of data visualization, check out these Viridis palettes. There are websites where you can just say, I am visualizing something with six colors, give me six colors. And it will give you six colors from one of the palettes. And then you can use that. If you're making a chart in Excel, you can just change the colors to match what the Viridis website spits out at you. If you're using R or Python, there are built-in Viridis palettes that you can use. Um, Stata doesn't. You just have to use a website and take the colors out of the website and use them in Stata. But you can do all of this stuff. So that is contrast. That was kind of the biggest chunk of the, of the acronym that we have with CRAP, with Contrast, Repetition, Alignment, Proximity. Um, and contrast is kind of the biggest, most complicated field there. So we saw that we can add contrast with font families, with font weights, with sizes, with colors, and we'll see a few other ways that you can have contrast too. So let's look at repetition next, the R in crap. This idea is fairly simple. This just means repeat something throughout the entire piece. Um, so if you have a whole bunch of headings in your document, 
make sure all the headings are the same. Like don't have one be a sans serif heading and then the next be a different sans serif heading and the next be an even differenter one. Like just use the same sans serif heading. Um, it helps tie the whole document together. Um, if you have some sort of layout, like you have text in one area and images in another area, keep copying that throughout the document um, or do minor variations of it, like mirror it or something. But you want to kind of repeat that same idea that you have. Um, you can repeat all sorts of things. You can repeat colors. Um, if you have a document where you're using blue, just use the same blue throughout or maybe two blues that contrast like a light blue and a dark blue, but don't use a light blue and a slightly lighter blue and a slightly darker blue because then that breaks contrast and it breaks repetition. Um, the, the breaks both C and R in our crap guidelines. Fonts, repeat those. Um, if you're going to stick with like having bold headings and light text, keep doing that throughout. Don't start adding extra bold and extra light unless it, it works with the thing or like you don't want to have it be too busy. Um, you do want to repeat things. If you have some sort of graphical element, repeat that. Um, you'll often see in magazines, like the New Yorker, the Atlantic, lots of other places do this. At the end of the article, it'll have like a tiny square or some sort of icon or some sort of glyph that they stick at the end that marks like, this is the end. Um, they do that for the sake of repetition. Every one of their articles has that. And often they'll use that same shape in other parts of the publication and kind of repeat that same idea. Um, there's a reason for having that there. Um, you can also repeat alignments, which we'll talk about in a minute because we haven't talked about the A in crap, but we will in a minute. So for instance, here's an example of, uh, this is an annual report from Oxfam International or Oxfam America. So Oxfam is an international NGO that does international development type stuff. And this is their annual report. And the reason I have this here is it looks good, um, mostly because of repetition. So these are two random pages from the document. One is page five and one is page nine. So they're not like side by side in the real document. Um, but if you look at this, try to identify all the things that are repeated. Like the layout itself is repeated. You have this larger title, you have this little subtext under it. You have this um, article on the side, two pictures with the captions underneath it, with the running footer down here. It looks the same over here. Um, so that the general layout is repeated. If you look up at the titles, it's using some kind of funky sans serif font that's a little bit like party-like. Um, even though the colors are different, this has green and blue, this has purple and less purple and red, um, it still feels like it's the same document because it's repeating that same um, color swashiness across both of the pages and it's repeating that same font. The font that they use underneath for this little a mini paragraph. It's the same font. It's some sort of light sans serif font. This one's blue, this one's pink, but it's still the, the underlying design of it is repeated. Starts with a, a heading that is in all caps. Same thing over here. Um, everything is left aligned. The captions are all left aligned. Everything's just kind of repeated and it feels good. You look at this and you're like, wow, that's well designed. Um, and it's mostly because of the R in crap where things are repeated nicely throughout the whole document or throughout the page. Okay, alignment, the A in crap. This one's fun because it's also fairly easy. Um, and once you realize how it works, like you'll see it everywhere. So the concept of alignment is that anything on the page should generally be connected to something else on the page. Everything needs to be anchored somehow. And you don't want to have just like free flying things that aren't really aligned with anything. So an example of that is this picture here. This is from some electrical engineering textbook or something. Um, so if you look at this, like it's nice. It's got some good contrast here. This example six text is bold. This is light. It's sans serif. It's a good font choice. Great. Um, the main issue here though is alignment and the, the neat thing about alignment is you can actually, like what I recommend, if we were in person, I would have like papers, um, print this out. You can, can actually draw lines to see how things are aligned. So if we take the E, the edge of the E right here, an example, draw a line down. This is one of the alignments that we could potentially use. 
Here's another alignment, the edge of this box here. Here's another alignment. Here's another one. And here's another one. If we look at horizontal alignments, we have the bottom of this text. We have the bottom of this text. We have the bottom of this box. We have the bottom of that box. And we have the bottom of that box. So if you count those up, that's a ton of alignments. Um, so if we want to follow the A in crap, all we have to do is try to share as many alignments as possible and to get things to kind of be anchored. And so it's fairly simple. All we really have to do is rearrange the stuff. And if we do this, that's all we have to do. Like we didn't change any fonts. We didn't change any colors. All we did was just kind of rearrange stuff so that it clicks in with other things on the page. And it makes all the difference here. Um, where now we just have one nice strong alignment over here. These things are aligned at the bottom. Everything just kind of fits. If we wanted to start adding other elements, like maybe we wanted the logo of an organization here, we could put that maybe in this blank spot, but I would probably try to make it so that the left or the right edge of it aligns with this line here and the bottom of it aligns over here. So it kind of fits in that corner and feels nice and anchored. Another thing I might try to do is this percent actually kind of goes beyond like there's that and then it goes out to there. Um, I might like break the line like right before one. And so 1% would go down onto the next line. So it's not going beyond that alignment. Um, there's a question in the chat about should we justify text? Um, sometimes. So just the reason we have justified text is for the sake of alignment. If you ever look in a book, most books are justified. And so there's hyphens to make it so the lines aren't too spacey. But because it's justified, it feels like one solid block of text. And so that means you can, like you'll often see in a book, if you look at the, the outside edge where the words are ending, the page number for that page will probably be aligned with the side, like the end of the text, because it basically makes a block. Um, and so for the sake of alignment, that fits really well. Um, so for print, I recommend like if you're doing some sort of nice print thing, justify the text um, if it's longer text, because that lets you create kind of text blocks on the page. If you don't have a lot of text, then justification isn't necessary. Like if this was justified right here, this area, um, it's already kind of unbalanced. Um, like this, if it was fully justified, this closed would come all the way out to the edge, which would add a whole bunch of unnecessary space between those words to kind of stretch it out. And that would look weird. So you don't want to justify that. But if this was longer text, like a whole paragraph, I'd probably justify that and make it align with kind of the outside here. Um, as far as online, that's trickier. And it's only because of technological limitations. Um, so programs like InDesign, which you use for kind of print publications, are really good at um, hyphenation algorithms. And so they're really good at making sure the lines aren't too spacey and that it automatically inserts hyphens where necessary to make it so the text fits. Um, web browsers are responsible for their own hyphenation algorithms. So Microsoft has to develop their own for Internet Explorer or Edge or whatever they call it. Um, Firefox has to invent their own hyphenation system. Chrome has to invent their own hyphenation system. Apple has to do their own through Safari. And so as a result, it's not always 100% consistent. Um, and sometimes the lines will be too spacey. Um, sometimes the lines will break funny, it won't hyphenate consistently. So I generally don't do hyphenated stuff on the web. And if you look pretty much anywhere on the web, um, like Washington Post, New York Times, Vox, 538, nobody really justifies there. Also just because there's too much variation across browsers, but in print design, definitely lots of things are justified and it's because of alignment. Um, because of that graphic design principle that we have. Um, so yeah, you can also combine these principles. And so right here, these are the, the same lines that we just drew. So we're, we're adding alignment by making everything match, but that also meets the principle of repetition, the R in crap, because we're repeating the same alignment. So everything shares the same left alignment and everything shares kind of the same top and that top alignment. Um, so you can combine these principles. Another way to combine alignment is with contrast. Um, 
very often, most likely because that's how we've been taught in like high school and college is you center your titles and you have your text be left aligned, um, which is fine. That's what like the Chicago Manual of Style says to do in manuscripts. That's what APA says to do. That's what MLA says to do. Everybody does that. But it's not a very strong contrast. Um, we have a center alignment right here. And then we have a left alignment right there. Um, which is fine. We have two different contrast or two different alignments. But if we want to be not wimpy about it, you can be like super contrastful and maybe have this part be right aligned and this part be left aligned. And so what that ends up looking like is something like this, um, where the chapter number and the chapter title are right aligned. And then the text itself here is, in this case, left justified. So you, you can see the hyphenations here, the hyphenation here. This will look different depending on your browser again, like your browser might not put a hyphen right here at the ADI dash, it might do something else. Um, but you can see because it's justified, it creates a nice strong alignment right there. If I was gonna add a page number, it'd be probably somewhere like there or down here at the bottom of the page, but aligned, sharing that same alignment there. Um, and it adds good strong contrast. You have super far right and super far left and no kind of middling center. Centering is fine, but if you're going to center stuff, I generally recommend not mixing it with left and right, but like going all in and having the whole thing be centered for the sake of repetition, um, because it's hard to get good contrast between left and center or center and right, because they're too close to each other. Um, so that's contrast or uh, A R C R A. That was alignment mixed with contrast. Um, so the last letter in our acronym is P. And this one's pretty easy too. Um, this is proximity, which means you just group things that go together together and try to create a visual hierarchy of sorts so that when somebody looks at the object, they know where their eyes should go and what is the most important piece of information, what's the second most important piece, et cetera. Um, so you can do this lots of different ways. You can add additional white space. You can use different colors. You can use the other elements of crap. You can use contrast, repetition, alignment. Um, to make some sort of grouping so that it's easy to understand what's going on. So this is an example of bad proximity, this fake business card here. You look at it and you say like the organization, the company is named Mermaid Tavern, I guess. But if you want to call them or send them a letter or go to their ho or house, go to their office, um, you have to choose your own adventure and choose one of those corners and hope you get it right. So if you wanted to call them and you look down in this corner, that's London, New Mexico, wrong. So you just kind of look around until you see the number, which isn't great for proximity. There's no visual hierarchy and there's no kind of logical groupings. So if we just rearrange it a little bit and make everything centered for alignment's sake, um, that works really well. That has good proximity. This is the guy's name and his company, and there's the contact information. Um, so proximity wise, this is good. There's two logical groupings, name, contact information. Contrast wise, we have this darker text and the lighter text. Alignment wise, everything is nice and centered. Repetition, it's the same font used throughout, just um, different um, weights within that font. And so it works well um, because of that. So that those are the four principles. Um, as long as you know those and get practice implementing them and recognizing them, you should do well. So these are the four. We have contrast, repetition, alignment, and proximity. Um, so what we're going to do is practice um, both using these principles and recognizing these principles. So first, we're going to practice recognizing them because this is actually pretty easy. Again, this is kind of a secret code where any designed object you see from now on, like look around and you'll see any sort of paper on your desk or a book or something look at it and you'll say, where's the contrast? And you will start identifying the contrast and the repetition and the alignment and the proximity. And it's like eye-opening. Um, it also gives you a language for critiquing things, where if you see something that looks well-designed or something that looks poorly designed, you can now explain why. You can say, this doesn't work very well because the contrast is weak. These fonts are too close to each other. There's too many blues, something like that. It gives you a way to, to talk about this stuff. So what we're going to do is I'm going to first, um, with you all, look at a poorly designed flyer and go through 
this crap checklist and look at contrast, repetition, alignment, proximity, and we'll critique it. And then we'll break out into smaller groups and I will give you some designed objects to look at. And you can go through the same checklist and say, what is what, what is well done with contrast? What is poorly done with contrast, et cetera. Um, so I'm going to find this thing. If I come to, if you go to the main website for this workshop, which again is in the chat, if you scroll up, it's that andhs.co slash GPL design. I'll also put the, the full URL in here for people who came in after I chatted that. Um, if you scroll down, there's these workshop activities. We'll get to these in a minute. Right now, I'm just going to click on the my turn because that's what I'm doing. Um, and here's a poster. So one of my fun hobbies that I do is when I walk through any public space like a library or something, I will inevitably take pictures of ugly flyers for workshops like this. Um, I have a collection of them. Um, this is from Utah because I have not been on campus since March 2020, and I only started at GSU like a few months before then. Um, so I don't have a collection of Georgia-based ugly flyers yet um, because I've just been locked down. So we're using a whole bunch of Utah ugly flyers instead because that's where I was before I got here. So Utah stuff. Um, so this was in the library at Brigham Young University. I saw it and was like, wow, that's not great. And so I took a picture of it. Um, so the reason it's not great is because it violates all sorts of principles of crap, of contrast, repetition, alignment, and proximity. And so what we can do is actually discuss this and figure out why it doesn't work well. So we can start with contrast. And generally, I go straight to fonts with contrast. And so if we look here, there are a couple different fonts here. There's this light sans serif font, connect with. There's this bolder sans serif font. 90% sure that's the same font. This is just bolder and that's not. It's probably just Arial, bold, Arial, regular. Um, and then they use a serif font too. If you look down here with the, um, the social media stuff down here, that's all serif font. I'm guessing that's probably just Times New Roman. Um, so they do have contrast between font families. They have a serif font and a sans serif font. Neat. Um, not the greatest fonts in the world. Arial and Times New Roman are like universal and super generic, but at least there's some contrast there that works. Um, but those are not the only fonts here. If you look at the logo for the organization, whatever nonprofit this is, you have Safe Kids Utah County. That's a different sans serif font from here. Look at the S. This S comes down further, like right here this S ends earlier and it's a lighter font. So this is not the same font here. So this logo came from their corporate side. They have brand guidelines that they're supposed to follow, but then with the rest of the, the design, they didn't follow those. Um, if they had gotten the sans serif font from the official logo, that would match really well for the sake of like repetition. It would repeat this font. So one thing I would try to do is if I were doing this, I would want to get this font here. So it would match here. If I couldn't get that font, then I would try to avoid using a sans serif font because this and this don't contrast very well. Um, so if I couldn't get that font, one thing I might do is change this sans serif stuff to a slab serif, like a big wanted sign or something. Um, so that would that contrasts well with this unobtainable sans serif font and that works. So that, that's one way you could improve the, the contrast there and the repetition there. Um, other, so that, that's generally contrast there with typography. We can look at contrast of colors too. There is a blue right here in the kids. There's a blue right here. There's a blue right here. There's a blue in the mountains in that logo right there. Facebook and Twitter and Instagram are all different colors. They're not the same blue. What I think they were trying to do was use the Facebook version of blue and the, the Twitter version of blue and some random red from the Instagram logo. Um, so we end up with one, two, three, four, five, six different blues on that page, which does not provide good contrast. First of all, like it's all shades of the same blue. And it doesn't help with repetition. Um, we want to repeat that same blue throughout. So what I would do if I were doing this, I would choose probably this blue right there because that's the, the corporate blue. 
And I'd repeat that throughout. And I wouldn't try to do this Facebook fake blue and Twitter trying to match their thing. I'd probably just actually stick the icons here instead of writing out Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. Um, so that would help with, with contrast in colors. Um, but that is also the only color besides this accidental red Instagram thing. So if I wanted more color contrast, I could go to Adobe Color, put in this blue as my base color and see what other things might match. I think orange is one of the contrasting colors to that blue. There's probably a good orange that you could throw in there to kind of maybe make that hashtag be orange or make part of the title be orange or something to kind of add color contrast to it. Um, repetition wise, again, repeat that same blue, um, that would help, um, alignment. Let's look at that part. There's center alignment right here. That's good. There is left alignment right here. There's right alignment right there. There's left alignment right here. Um, if we draw a line across the top here. There's some empty space. This logo for Utah County could probably be moved up so that it aligns with the top of the S's. Or if we draw a line across Utah County, the bottom of Utah County isn't, I drew it funny because I'm using this trackpad here, but it's not perfectly aligned with the bottom of connect with, which is also not aligned with the bottom of health department. And so an easy way to fix that is just get all of those in line, like bump the logo down a little bit, bump the text down a little bit, make it so they're all sharing that same horizontal line. Um, down here, if they're gonna go with center, make every, like make all of this stuff center. Maybe convert these into logos and put them right next to it and then center it right here. QR codes, just get rid of those. Just, nobody's gonna take a picture of those. Um, and so that, that could help with, with alignment, make everything justified right in the middle. Or if you wanna be super contrastful, take this part, move it over to the left, take this part, move it over to the right, and then there's some good strong contrast there. That could work. Lots of different things you can do with alignment. And then proximity, the P in crap. Is there a visual hierarchy here? Maybe. Like the main call to action here is they want people to follow their social media accounts. But if you look at this really quick, the main call to action is that an organization named Safe Kids Utah County exists because the title is really big. The follow, connect with us on social media, that's really small. This stuff looks kind of obscure. It doesn't really tie in with that. Maybe adding a bunch more space here um, so that all the social media accounts are down and near the bottom and easier to see, kind of more visually distinct. Do something to make it so that there's a, a clearer call to action is what I would do. Um, also potentially merge these two things because these are, I think that's the organization and that's like the sponsor. So maybe put both logos in one of the corners and make them small. I don't know. There's lots of ways you could do it, but um, we're talking about proximity using this language of design. So that is in general, how you go through designs like this. You say, you look at contrast, look at typographic contrast, look at um, color contrast, look at contrast in alignments. Um, then you look at repetition, which which things are repeated, which things should be repeated. Um, then you look at alignment, which is where you actually draw lines on the page if you have it on paper um, and see what things line up with what things. Um, and then check for proximity, make sure there's a visual hierarchy, make sure things that should be together are together and that it's clear what you're supposed to do with the flyer. Um, so that is a, a basic critique using these crap principles. So what we're gonna do is I'm going to split you into groups um, automatically using WebEx's random work group thing. And if you go to the um, page for today, again, that's in the chat there, there's a page that says your turn number one. And I there are three designed objects there that you can download. And what your job is, is for the next 10 minutes, you're going to critique these things, contrast, repetition, alignment, and proximity. And I give you kind of scripts here, things that you should look for as you do this. Um, and it should be pretty useful because now you have language to talk about this. Um, so I'm gonna divide you up, but first I'm gonna uh, answer Felix's question here. Do I have any font resources? Yes. Um, so if you scroll down on this, this main page here, 
um, has the activities, has the slides, but it also has a whole bunch of helpful resources. Um, so here's a summary of those craft principles. Here's a link to that book, um, a whole bunch of different color resources, the Viridis palettes. There's also probably the, the best resources, this, this website called Google Fonts, um, where you can download thousands of different fonts for free and use them however you want. And the nice thing about Google Fonts is if you click on categories here, you can actually only show sans serif fonts or only show serif fonts. Now you know what those are. The other cool thing is if you click on a font, um, they keep track of what fonts are used when because Google tracks all our information. So if you scroll down to the bottom of a font page, it actually says, here are some things that are popular, popularly paired with this existing font. So for instance, often people use this, this Castoro font with Roboto, which is a sans serif font. And if you switch it, you can say, this, this is what text would look like if it used this Roboto heading and then this Castoro uh, body text. And you can look at other common ones too and see kind of existing contrast that you have. There's also a link here to something called the ultimate collection of Google font pairings, um, where people like official graphic designers have found good combinations of fonts. And if you scroll down, you can see all sorts of good combinations of fonts. Um, and yeah, so that's also another good resource that you can use. Okay, so go ahead and go to the your turn number two option or page or your turn number one page. And I'm going to split you out into little breakout sessions for 10 minutes. Um, and you're going to critique these using your new language of crap. All right, welcome back, everybody. Hopefully that was a useful exercise. Um, I gave you one really ugly one and then one okay one and then really nice one. Hopefully you, you saw that pattern there. Um, so for instance, this right here is ugly. But now you can explain why it is ugly. So does anybody in your chat, you, you talked about this. Um, did somebody say what was wrong contrast wise with this thing? What What was deficient in its contrast? What were some of the issues that you saw? Okay, so there's just one color used throughout. They used Duke blue. So that's good for repetition, I guess. Um, they repeated that same blue, um, but it doesn't help with contrast. So alignment wise, there's two alignments, I guess. There's the centered right here. This is all centered, but then over here you have left alignment. You have another left alignment here. In part, that's because I think this was a bulleted list. They may have made this in like PowerPoint, which always defaults to, to bulleted lists. Um, so yeah, bullets not needed. Technically, if you think about alignment, if you look at the alignment of these bullets, it is like wrong. Um, that bullet is aligned with like the bottom of the H when really it should be like the middle of the H. I don't know how they did that. Um, magic. So no graphic elements present. Yeah, there's no like logo. I, uh, this is technically a picture, I think, um, because Duke has like logos that they share with people, but that's like not helpful. Yeah, sim same font, similar font sizes. There's only two font sizes. There's this that's big-ish, and then there's this that's slightly bigger or slightly smaller, but this is the same size as everything else, so that's not helpful. I love this colon right here. Like, why? will volunteer colon something. Um, but I'm guessing that you all have created similar things um, in the past. I know I have before I knew about this crap stuff. Yeah, so proximity wise, there are directions, um, but it's really hard to see the directions. Like you have the location, but then directions here and then right below it, it's suddenly like the schedule thing. So group these things more logically for the p in proximity and, and make it easier to, to understand so what about this pdf what was bad about this crap wise or good about this crap wise okay so there is one alignment whoever did this knew about crap principles you can tell because there's just one left alignment throughout there is one place where this breaks um it's actually with this title that is left aligned here. The title is, is kind of left aligned off of the side. 
if I were doing this, I would actually scoot this over a little bit so that the title also aligns with the rest of it and maybe scoot this Q world thing over a little bit more. Um, but yeah, everything else is like consistently aligned. Font size, weight, and color. Is that good or bad? So to unified, no contrast. So there is contrast here between the font family. This is a chunky slab serif, and then this is sans serif. So that that works for families. But then the rest of this is all just very like white, just like the headings, and it's kind of hard to read. Um, and it's hard to distinguish everything, um, mostly because the color is just overwhelmingly white right here. Um, that also the italics, like look at the italic version of the sensor font. It doesn't even look very italic. It's just kind of like, bleh, which doesn't give a lot of contrast. Um, strong alignment, uh, different color for like the stats here. Where's the call to action? What are you supposed to do as a result of this thing? It's way down here. Um, it repeats the same bullet point, this little, um, water drop thing down here, but that doesn't need to be a bullet point that could just be without it and make this bigger and more prominent because that's the organization probably wants people to donate to them. So make that bigger. And then if we go look at the at doctors without borders here, that's pretty good. Um, they hired, they probably paid tens of thousands of dollars for this thing. Um, and you can tell it looks great. So you can, like, there are probably points in here where you could critique it and say, like, things need to be aligned better. But in general, this was pretty well done. Um, as far as that question, can there be too much repetition? Yeah, this feels very, like, it, they have contrast in color. Like, it's this blue and orange that fits on the color wheel thing that works. Um, but it's just all blue and white, and it is kind of boring. And so adding some other contrast to break up the repetition would help. Um, cool. You've just critiqued stuff. You talk like graphic designers now, which is cool because before this, you probably had never thought about these graphic design principles, contrast, repetition, alignment, proximity. Um, all right. So before we move on to how to actually do this, and we'll actually get to play with a program called Canva to do this. Um, we do need to talk briefly about some technical details that you'll come across um, whenever you're doing any sort of design. And often people don't always understand the difference between different image types and, and we'll, what programs do what. So we're going to briefly talk about that here. You all have used image files on your computer. Like you take a picture with your phone and then it exists and then you can airdrop it to yourself at your computer or email it to yourself, like you know what files are. Um, but with images, there's two general categories of files. There are things called bitmap images, um, which internally, like computer science in the computer science world, internally these are stored as just collections of squares or pixels. Um, and so like I remember on our family computer, we got like Windows 95 when I was like 11 and Microsoft Paint was awesome because I could zoom in super far and see like a grid and I could like make like pixel art using Microsoft Word or Microsoft Paint, not Word. Um, and I could use those those pixels um, and that's stored as a bitmap image or as a raster image as well. Um, different name for the same principle where it's, it's a, just a collection of dots, basically a collection of squares. Um, and that works. That's an efficient way of storing images, especially photographs, um, because photographs have lots and lots of colors in them. And so um, just saying that each of these different parts of the photograph are different squares, that's that's a good, efficient way to do it. Um, there are different types of bitmap images. There are JPEGs that you'll see, um, which are generally used for photographs. There are PNG files, which are generally better for things that are not photographs, like um, graphs um, or logos or things with fewer colors in them. And there are reasons why, and I'll show that in a minute here. The other type of image that you'll see are called vector images. And here, internally, the computer does not store boxes. Instead, it stores math. Um, it stores equations, basically. It's nice because you don't have to actually understand the math or the equations or anything like that. Um, it takes care of all of that behind the scenes for you. But what it basically does, like if you look at this one right here, 
it's saying draw a line from this point to this point, draw a curvy line from this point to this point and make it curve at some angle and then draw a line and draw a line so that it's defined that way. The reason this is neat though, is because it's not a whole bunch of boxes. You can shrink this down to whatever size you want and you can grow it to whatever size you want. If you wanna put this 1992 thing on a billboard, you can enlarge it to like 3000 point font and you won't see any pixelation. There won't be any weird boxes that you'll see. If you took this 1992 and enlarged it a lot, it would look really chunky and gross because each of those little boxes that the computer stores would suddenly be like this big. And that's awful. And you've probably seen this before if you've ever printed things. Um, if you print like a low resolution image, that resolution basically means the size of the boxes that it stores. And so if you make it too big, it's gonna look awful. Um, and so these vector images are great because they're infinitely resizable, shrinkable. Um, basically anything that you, like a PDF, most things in PDFs are vector based. You can put images like photographs in PDFs. Those won't be infinitely zoomable, but text <laughs> is. If you type something in Word and then change the font to something huge, all fonts are technically vector images. And so that's why you can go super tiny and super big. Um, so to show some differences here, this is a PNG file of a graph. Um, it's appropriate as a PNG file because it doesn't have a lot of colors. And if you zoom in on it, if you look at this purple blob right here, every one of these squares, if you zoomed in really far, is like the same purple. And so the computer stores this whole region as purple. That's what happens behind the scenes. Um, if you saved the same graph as a JPEG, um, at this level, it looks okay, but if you zoom in, notice the purple blob. You might have to get like really close to your computer here. The purple blob is no longer the same purple all the way through. There are little splotches of darker purple and lighter purple. Um, and that is because that's how JPEGs work. JPEGs were invented for photographs. That's what the P in JPEG stands for. I don't know what the J or the G stand for, but P is photograph. Um, and so if you're taking a picture of like a tree, you don't necessarily need every single possible green in the leaves of the tree. And so what the JPEG algorithm does is it kind of blurs stuff a little bit for the sake of storage space on your computer, um, which is fine because nobody's gonna notice a little bit of blurring in the leaves. If you have a graph like this though, people are gonna notice that, especially if you lower the quality even more. So this is a 10% quality. Even here, if you look a little bit closely, you'll see weird splotches. If you zoom in though, look at this great purple splotch with all sorts of gray around it. The grid lines are starting to get all distorted now that no longer intersects. There's weird gray splotches out there. And that's just because JPEGs start doing weird distortion-y things. Um, and that's a normal thing. You've probably seen stuff like this all the time on social media, um, Facebook images that people upload. Every time you upload like an image to Facebook, it recreates the JPEG and will throw it through the algorithm, algorithm again. So you eventually get things that look like this, like it's just giant chunks of pixels, which looks great. Um, and over time, things start degrading. So there's this comic here that shows like digital data never degrades because it's just like ones and zeros, but like this stuff starts happening. You get screenshots of screenshots of things turning into JPEGs and then screenshot it again. And, it just starts turning into this. And the reason why is because the computer is doing weird distortions to it. That doesn't mean you should never ever use JPEGs. JPEGs are great for photos. That's again, why they were invented. So this picture right here, um, I took with a, a fancy DS DSLR camera using raw um, images. So there's no compression whatsoever. Every one of these pixels in the raw format is the exact color that the camera picked up. It doesn't do any blurring or any, any magical compression stuff. So that one picture by itself is almost 30 megabytes. So if I'm like taking pictures of my family and take like a hundred pictures in the space of like two hours, that's like three gigabytes of pictures in just like an hour. So that's like wild. Um, so generally people will do that. Like professional photographers will take pictures in raw because it gives you lots of control for editing, but then you shrink it down to kind of a high quality JPEG so that you can email that to somebody. Um, so if I save the same image as a 75% quality JPEG, it's only three megabytes, that's emailable. Um, I could bump the quality way down. That's what's actually, this picture right here is only 10% quality because it's tiny. 
I'm not trying to put it on a billboard. Um, and so I can shrink it down a lot. Um, if I zoomed in on the sky, there'd be weird blurring, which is fine. It's a sky with different shades of blue in it. This grass here is all going to be blurry again. Fine. But JPEG is invented for that. If I save the same JPEG as a PNG, which was invented for kind of simpler colors and like graphs and things like that, suddenly the PNG is even bigger than the raw JPEG or the raw non JPEG photo. Um, so you don't want to save photographs as like PNG files. That's not what it was invented for. Um, so in general, when you're working with images um, as you're designing stuff, you want to use the right type of file. So photographs, you're going to use JPEGs um, because again, that's why they were invented. If you're doing anything with graphs or logos, you're going to want to either do a PNG if you're doing it like on the web, um, where most like web browsers in theory should support vector images. That's what this SVG is. It's a vector thing that works on the internet. It's not 100% consistent, um, but it it works. If you're doing print stuff, then you're going to want to save graphs like this as PDFs because then you can zoom in and out infinitely and, and it works. Okay. So how do you actually make these things? There are specific programs in the Adobe world. So Adobe Creative Cloud is kind of this constellation of fancy, really expensive programs that are used professionally. These are like industry standard programs for making these things. Um, if you're doing anything with photos or raster images or bitmaps, that's what Photoshop is for. You can tell because it's in the name. Um, you're not going to want to make long documents or flyers or posters with Photoshop. Photoshop is for photos. Um, there's a, an open source clone of Photoshop called GIMP. It does everything Photoshop does, but it's like really awful user interface and it's miserable to use, but it's free. So you can check that out. There's also a freemium um, photo editor called Canva, which we'll play with in a little bit. Freemium meaning like it's free, but you can also pay for different plans to get extra features or something, but you can also use it for free. If you're doing anything with vectors, the industry standard for that is Illustrator. Um, so if you're making logos or if you're editing graphs by hand, do that in Illustrator. The open source version of that is called Inkscape. Again, it's kind of miserable to use, but it's free. Um, the freemium version of it is called Gravit, Gravit Designer that lets you do vector editing in your browser. It's free. You can also pay for plans. Um, so that's a possibility. If you're doing anything that's a longer document that combines, like if you have pictures going into it and vectors going into it and a logo to go into it, that's what InDesign is for, which um, lets you do longer documents like books and articles and uh, brochures. And it lets you place images and place vector things into it. The open source version of it is called Scribus. Once again, awful to use, but free. And Canva will also let you do document like things. And so you can kind of use Canva to do basic graphic design stuff. So what, what these look like just really quick. So this is InDesign right here. Um, so if you look here, this is the book I showed earlier. Um, so in design, this is a longer document. Like if I zoom out here, you can actually see the side by side pages and the text. And so this is like how you actually make books. Um, but you can also incorporate things so like this little picture here is, a is a vector image. So I could zoom in infinitely on this, this mountain thing. Um, also I can zoom in infinitely on the text. This is the logo for this press that I did the book for. Um, so it lets you combine all of these things, text and photos and logos and everything all in one place. Um, for the sake of alignment, look at this. The top of this text is aligned with the top of the title text. Neat. Um, so that, that's what InDesign is for. Illustrator looks like this, um, where you can create kind of logos. This is, again, like I mentioned at the beginning, I make logos for all of my classes, which again is probably like extra, but I do it. Uh, for fun. So these are different logos with different versions of it and I can export them at different sizes, make them however big I want. Um, so that's what Illustrator is. These are all vectors. So there's no dots here. These are all just mathematical formulas. You can't see the math, which is nice. It's just that's how it, it works behind the scenes. So that is basically how you create these things. So what we're going to do now is create some stuff and introduce you to a program called Canva. So if you go to um, canva.com, 
um, which I just put in the chat there. It's not linked. Let me. You can create a free account. I think you can even use your Google account. So if you're already logged into your to Gmail through your browser or something, you should just be able to click on like two buttons and you'll have a Canva account. So go ahead and create a Canva account. And while you do that, I'm going to briefly show you how Canva works. Um, and then you are going to get to practice with it. So let me go to canva.com. And I rarely actually use Canva because I do everything in the Adobe stuff here. Um, but I have my students use Canva because it's free, um, which is good. The Adobe stuff used to be free for GSU students and then Adobe quit doing that. So that's great. Um, so in Canva, they have a whole bunch of different templates that you can use. They're like pre-designed for you. They have professional designers make these things, but you can also create a blank design. So I can just click on create design here. And again, it has all these suggested things. I don't care about those. I'm just gonna say a custom size. You're gonna make it eight and a half inches wide by 11 inches tall. It's complaining because it's pixels. So let's switch that to inches. And type these numbers again, 8.5 and 11. Okay, so this will give me a blank page, which will look like that. Okay, so we have a nice blank page. The nice thing about um, Canva is it's fairly intuitive. If you want to add text, you click on text. And then you can start adding, they have these weird, you can put an open sign on there, I guess. Neat, love you, wow or just put regular text. You can just like drag a heading out here. So if we wanted to recreate that Safe Kids Utah poster that we looked at before, um, I can do that. Can't remember what the poster looks like. Have it open in Illustrator. Safe Kids Utah County is what it's called. Cool. So in Canva, I can come here and say Safe Kids Utah County with a space and a capital C. Cool. So right now it's centered. Um, we can change this. Let's make it, we'll make everything on this poster be left aligned. So we can kind of move this around. That's good. Cool. So if we just do that, that kind of feels like it's left aligned, but it feels wrong. It feels like it should be centered. It's not really anchored with anything on the page. So one thing we can do is kind of add some extra graphical elements to make it fit better. Um, and you can add like lines and shapes. So we're going to add a line here, a up and down a vertical line here, like so, just to kind of let us anchor stuff. So it's more obvious that we have um, like everything's supposed to be left aligned. Okay. Then we can add some more text. Um, we'll just add some body text here. So the text that was on that poster said something like, learn child safety tips to help you keep kids safe. So we'll say, learn child safety tips. But we'll actually type in the box here. Learn child safety tips to help, hashtag, keep kid safe. Okay, so now what we can do is start going through our crap checklist. So we have alignment, like we're making everything left aligned with this, this, this line here that works. So that means this text, interesting, this child safety thing should also probably be aligned similarly, like follow that same alignment here. Contrast wise, we probably want it to um, be a different font. So maybe we'll have this font be kind of a big chunky serif. Um, a slab serif. So if we look at the font list, Canva connects to Google fonts and provides like 80% of them for free. Um, so if we scroll down, I think there's, I think it has like chunk in the name. Let's search for that chunk. Chunk five. Cool. All right. So we'll make that nice and chunky. And then we'll make this text sans serif, but we'll make it bigger. Probably like that. And so then I can kind of add a line break here and then add a line break there. This is centered. We don't want that. So we can click on this to make it left aligned. Move it over to the side here like that. Okay. It's getting there. It's still kind of boring. 
So the whole design process is always very iterative. So you just like throw something on the page and try it. So we're gonna change the color here. We'll use blue because that's like the safe kids blue that they had. If you wanna use a specific blue, you can put the hex code for it up here. And that, like if you have a brand specific blue you have to use, you can add that. Um, we can make this hashtag here be a contrasting orange. Not the greatest, but it looks okay, I guess. Neat. Okay, so really that that's all you do with Canva. It's really easy to drag stuff around. You can have, um, there's like built-in icons if you want. So if you want the Instagram um, thing, because people are supposed to go visit Instagram, um, we can shrink this down and then like place it here and notice we want it to be aligned. That's aligned. Bring the Facebook one out. Shrink it down to match the same size for the sake of repetition. That should match. And then we could put the text for like the name of the Facebook page and the Instagram handle. You can do all sorts of stuff here. Um, but that's generally how you use Canva. You drag stuff around, change the font. Um, make change the colors, make sure there's contrast, make sure there's repetition, make sure there's alignment. It helps with alignment because you can, as you drag this stuff, it shows you guidelines to make sure everything's nice and aligned and then proximity. So what we're gonna do now is your turn. I'm going to give you 15 minutes in breakout groups. If you go to your turn number two, I'm going to give you an ugly flyer that I took a picture of in 2018, I think, um, that one. And you're going to create something similar. You're gonna recreate it. It doesn't have to be identical. You can change the text. That's a lot of text. You can actually throw away some of the text, whatever you want. Um, you're gonna use Canva to do it. And so there's instructions down here, basically evaluate the existing design. What does it do well with crap? What does it not do well with crap? And then use Canva to create a new one. Um, if you don't want to type all of that text, I have um, all of the text down here, so you can just copy and paste it. If you want to use this this Y hexagon logo thing, you can just right click on it and say save image as, and then you can upload that to Canva um, and then use it in the design. All right, welcome back, everybody. Um, I want to see what you guys made. Um, so if different groups want to share their screens really quick so we can show off your beautiful crapful design crap in a good way um share your screen we want to see this ah we have one in cool so if you click on the link in the chat room um one thing canva lets you do is share things um remotely cool <clears throat> so this one looks really cool uh, there's some good alignment. Um, the top of the Y logo seems to be aligned with the top of Free Workshop. Um, it could probably move over a tiny bit more so it aligns with the edge of the, the photo and the, the URL and the, the Instagram logo thing. Um, cool, good contrast with the font, um, good proximity. It's clear what the things are. There's visual hierarchy. It's clear where the date and time are. Um, Good. That's really great for 15 minutes of just throwing stuff together, but following the crap principles. Um, another group, share your stuff, either with the, the magic Canva share button, wherever that is. Um, you can click on share up at the top or you can share your screen. All right, I'm assuming it's gorgeous and fantastic, but we won't be able to see it. So um, that was a super crash course introduction to Canva. Um, I would recommend playing with it. Um, one really good thing that you can do to kind of practice with this is these redesigns, like find some ugly flyer that you see and then spend 20 minutes making a new improved one and then go through the crap guidelines. Make sure you have good contrast, repetition, alignment, proximity, um, and make sure it all works. And then that's kind of the easiest way to, to learn this is just to keep playing with it. Um, so what we're gonna do for the last little bit of the session here is work with a program that you all work with way more regularly than Canva. Um, lots of you may have already been exposed to Canva before. This may have been your first time. 
most of the time you're not creating flyers professionally. That's not your full-time job. You're writing stuff, you're researching things, and then you're writing up the results. Lots of you spend probably most of your time in Word. Um, and Word is actually a fairly powerful um, program for design, surprisingly. Um, it is a, it's a word processor. It was invented for just typing stuff. It has good like spell checking and thesaurus stuff and grammar stuff. Um, but it is also really good at allowing you to, um, throw design in there in powerful ways that help with the repetition in R or it, the R of, of repetition in prep. So what we're going to do, let me share my screen here so you can see a boring gross normal word document that you've all dealt with and let's get the chat back up here because it disappears okay so hopefully you're all familiar with word and how it works um and you've probably all played with formatting things in word like if you want this to be a different font you would select the text you would choose a different font if you want it to be smaller you would change it to be smaller um, et cetera. That's normally how we work with Word, um, in part because the, the program designers have made it so that the user interface naturally lends itself to clicking on stuff and formatting it. Like, um, it's very easy to just say, I want this to be a different font and to be left aligned or to be right aligned. And like, that's just, it makes it super easy to do that. Um, and so we can apply crap principles to this word file here. So right now this is all just boring Times New Roman 12 point font. So one thing we could do is we could select this text here. And instead of using Times New Roman, we'll use a nice serif font, but not Times New Roman. Um, if we scroll down, I've got a ton of fonts here. We're just gonna use some cool, we'll use this one, Book Antiqua, sure. So we'll use Book Antiqua Regular. That's a nice font. And so as I mentioned earlier, nothing is really ever printed in 12 point font that's really big. Um, so we can bump this down to like 11 point font. And that looks nice, cool. Um, we can also start adding some contrasts. So instead of having the headings be also 12 point font times New Roman, but with this underlining, um, we can have this be a sans serif font. Um, so if we scroll down, I have one right here. We'll just use this one at the top called Work Sans, and we'll make it semi-bold. Uh, we'll make it bold. And we're just iterating and playing here. We'll make it bold, Work Sans, and we'll take off the underlining. Cool. And we'll make it a little bit bigger. So we'll bump up the font to like 18. Cool. Um, we can also make this right aligned for the sake of contrast. That looks neat. So we've already got some, some good styling here. Um, we probably want some sort of visual separation between the heading and the text here, maybe some extra space. So if you hit enter, that's the cheating way to add extra space. You don't really want to do that in regular, in regular real life because that is now an empty line. And if, so if you click on this little P sign, this backwards P that's called a pill crow, um, that, lets you see kind of the hidden characters in Word, you can see that that's a, a blank paragraph here. The reason you don't want to just hit enter a bunch of times to, to add spacing between things is because it messes you up later. So let's say I want this analysis to start on the next page. I could come here and hit enter a bunch of times and it's gone. Or, oh, that works. So it's on a new page. But if I come back here later and say, oh, I forgot stuff for this background section, we better add it. And so we add it. Now when I scroll down, the analysis section is further down the page because it pushed everything down. So you don't really want to do that and just kind of hit enter a bunch of times um, in Word. There are better ways to add spacing after a paragraph and before a paragraph to kind of add that space without just hitting enter a billion times. Um, so we've got kind of some basic crap stuff going on here with good contrast. Um, for the sake of repetition, we need to make this paragraph the same. So you've probably all done this. You say this is book Antiqua 11, and you might write it down on a post-it note and put it on your desk and then go to the next paragraph and make sure it is book Antiqua 11. And then go down to the next paragraph, make sure it's book Antiqua 11. Or 
select all the text, make it all book and sequel 11, and then go back and change all of the headings to be whatever we said, work sans 18 bold right aligned. So then you'd have to make this work sans bold 18 right aligned. Um, and then if you decide to change that font later, then you have to go back and scroll through and change everything. And that's miserable. And you have all done it before, I'm guessing. Even I have done this. Um, and it's in part Word's fault. Word makes it really easy to do this kind of formatting right here. It's all just like right here at the main toolbar. Um, and so it's really tempting to just do all of your formatting that way. But for the sake of repetition, what Word actually lets you do is it has a shortcut to do this. Um, and you may have done this, you may have, have played with this already um, and had experience with this. But what you can do is use something called styles. And so if you look right here, there's this normal, no spacing, heading one. These are styles. And so if I put my cursor here in executive summary and tell it to be a head one, it just got rid of all my formatting, which is fine. We can fix that. But now it is this blue Calibri light 16 point thing. I come down to introduction and tell it to be a heading one. It is also now the same blue 16 point Calibri light. And I could come down to all of the headings and tell them to be heading ones and go throughout the document and do that. Where this gets really powerful is if I now want to change this heading so that it matches what we had before that right aligned um, work sans bold thing, I can actually right click on head here on heading one and click on modify. And what that lets me then do is modify the style here. And whatever I set it to here, it will then propagate to the rest of the documents. And so all of the headings will be the same. So instead of this Calibri light thing, I can go back to work sans bold 16. Sure. Oh, we had it like 22 or something. We'll do 22. Instead of this blue, we'll do black. Um, we'll have it be right aligned. And if I hit OK now, perfect. So sometimes it, it decides to keep that bold. Um, so now we have um, our headings that are repeated out and it uses that same design. And then we can come back here and go to modify and we can make other changes. Um, so sometimes it forgets to be bold because Word is not always great at this. Um, work sans bold, okay overriding there. Okay, so everything should now be work sans bold like that. Um, we can add some extra spacing before and after. So if we look right here and we get rid of this paragraph, the empty one, this is pretty close to the next heading. But if we go into the heading options or the style options and then click on format right here, we can tell it to format the paragraph. And include some spacing before and after the heading. So we can bump this up to like 30, 42 points, sure. And we'll give it a little bit of space after, something like 12. So now if we hit OK, each of these headings now has a bunch of space up above it. So you can see all of that empty space above introduction and a little bit of space below it. So for the sake of proximity, now you can see that this is all clearly kind of a group there. This is all clearly a group. Um, and I had to edit it in one place, which is the magical part about this. Um, I don't like I, if I scroll down further analysis right here is still using the old formatting. All I have to do is tell it to be heading one and now it is formatted correctly and magic. Um, this applies to, to any text generally best practice for using styles in word is to make sure every element of text in the document has some sort of style applied to it. So this would need a title style. This would need a style named date or something. Um, if you look right here, right now, we're only seeing like three styles at once. If you click on this arrow, it'll slide through to different styles. You can also click on this down arrow and see it this way. The best way is if you click on the styles pane, it'll open up a little sidebar here that has a list of all of the styles in the document. And so this is this is what I generally do is I just have this pane open and then I can see everything that needs to happen. Um, so for instance, we want to repeat the same book Antiqua 11 point font. 
Um, we could edit this normal style. Um, if I click on this little down arrow, I can then go modify that style and tell it to be book Antiqua 11, and then tell each of these paragraphs here to be normal. Or you can actually create your own styles. So if I just select some of this text and then click on new style, now I can name this something like my Nido Serif stuff. And then it's gonna be book Antiqua 11. Cool. So if I hit okay now, this paragraph, I can now tell it to be my Nito Serif stuff. And nothing really changed because it was already that way. But if I click on this next paragraph, which is currently Times New Roman 12, I can just click on my Nito Serif stuff and it changes. And so I can just go throughout the whole document and just click in a paragraph, tell it to be that um, all the way through. And then if later I want to change it to something else um, to match brand guidelines or something, you just come in here and say modify style and voila. Um, you can do all sorts of changes. It's not just like a, like justification and color and stuff. Um, so for instance, if I come to heading one and choose modify style, I can add a border, which might help visually tie this, this heading. Because right now the heading is kind of way off to the side and the text is way off on the other side. So if I add like a border, to the bottom of the text. Let's make it a solid, thick border at the bottom. So if I hit OK and OK, now each of these sections has this cool border there. And because there's enough space up above each of the headings, it kind of fits well. And you can see kind of the logical sections here. Um, there's good contrast with the alignment here. This is left aligned, that's right aligned, that's good, strong contrast good contrast between this heading and the text. Like it looks pretty good compared to what it looked like before. And so in general, you just go through and add styles for everything. And then you can go through your document and style stuff. So like this needs to be um, my Nido Serif stuff um, and so on. And so you just go through and, and create styles. Um, you can actually nest styles in each other, which is helpful. Um, for instance, this is the list right here. So if I select this list and tell it to be my Nito Serif stuff, it's no longer a list. We just killed the list for it. Um, but if I create a new style called my neat list, notice how it says it's based on my Nito Serif stuff. So if I change anything back with that original style, it'll actually propagate down to this one. So I can tell this to be a list um, or we'll make it bold. We can say format as a list. The list option is somewhere in here. You have to like dig through the menus to find the stuff. You can tell it to be indented a little bit. Cool. All right, so that's my neat list. So now we can tell these to be my neat list. And notice how it's automatically this book Antiqua 11. So if I came back and changed my Nito Serif stuff to some other font, the list would also change to that same font because they're connected and related. Um, and that's how styles work. Um, you have paragraph styles that apply to the whole paragraph. So if you've noticed, like when I was applying styles like recommendations, I didn't have to select the whole word. I just had to have my cursor in that paragraph somewhere, and then I can tell it to be heading one. Um, you can also have things called character styles that apply just to text within the paragraph. So for instance, if I want this, this greater things to be italicized, I can click italics, neat. Um, but if you want it to be special italicized, maybe have it be red, um, or often you'll see reports where the URLs are in sans serif font as a different color. So it kind of stands out so you know that it's like a web address instead of text. Um, what you can do is create a style just for paragraphs. So if I select this greater things thing, I can click on new style. And instead of creating a paragraph style, I'm going to create a character style and I will call it my fancy italics. So it's going to be italic. We'll also make it green. Sure. We'll also make it bold italic. Yeah. So if I hit okay, that's still like I didn't assign it to anything yet, but if I double click on some word 
and tell it to be my fancy italics. Now that that character, just that word right there, is green bold italic. And if I decide to change later, I don't want green. I can modify that style and tell it to actually be gold. Click OK. And then it changes throughout the whole document and makes everything gold, which is fantastic for the sake of repetition. Um, so again, ge general best practice is to style everything possible, um, in part because it makes your life way easier. Um, if you ever need to change anything, it will you just change it right here in the styles and you're done. Um, another thing is um, Word can generate tables of contents for you. And it generates those tables of contents based on styles. So you tell it to generate a table of contents that includes heading one. And then it will go through the document and see that this heading one paragraph recommendations is on page three. And then that's how you create the table of contents is because of um, the styles that you have assigned. You also have a navigation pane, Chris mentions in the chat here, where you can actually jump between different levels of your document. And so if you have a longer document, and you have like a chaptered style and then headings and subheadings. Instead of scrolling through the document like this forever and ever and ever, you can just use the navigation panel and jump around to um, different places or like this outline right here. That's not how you do it. Somewhere is the navigation panel. I rarely actually do stuff in Word here. Um, it's also what people do professionally in these um, more industry standards, so like InDesign where people make books and, and brochures and stuff. Everything in InDesign is also style-based. Um, so like right here, if I double click on this, this is called main text, the narrator main text with a drop cap. And so that's why the that big C is there. I could switch it to something else and it suddenly looks completely different. I could switch it to be the poem style. I could switch it to be this poem speech last. And so they're all just different styles. Um, here's the table of contents style, the copyright page. So like, that's the normal thing you do. The other nice thing about um, using styles in Word is those styles transfer to more professional programs. So if you do have like a designer on staff who does InDesign and uses that for creating annual reports or whatever, if you pre-style your stuff and then send it to them so they can stick it in, in, in InDesign and make it fancy, um, everything's already pre-assigned here. So it's really easy for them. Um, often that doesn't happen. So like in all of the books and things I do, no authors ever use styles. And so I just get like a plain Times New Roman formatted document and I have to guess what the headings are and what levels the headings are. And that's actually why if you've ever written like a paper in APA style or MLA style or Chicago, they have specific requirements for like heading ones have to be centered and bolded heading twos have to be left aligned and a specific size like there's these guidelines and as an undergrad you're like i hate this because i want it to look fancy um or i want to use headings differently the reason that is that is the way it is in chicago and mla and apa is so that the the typesetters will know which things are level one headings and level two and level three so it kind of standardizes it um, you can also create like a boring um, APA style thing here. So instead of saying heading one be right aligned with this really cool font, you can tell it to be centered bold times new Roman. Um, looks boring, but it's still based on a style. Um, so that makes it easier to be consistent. So that is, that's how you do this stuff in Word. It's the same principles, this contrast, repetition, alignment, proximity. Um, these, these design principles are kind of universally applicable to, to posters, to flyers, to videos, to uh, Word documents, to um, architecture, to fashion. They're all over the place. And so now you are fully equipped with these tools to make your own cool stuff. And you have the language to be able to critique things um, and to recognize why things look good or why things look bad and create your own good or bad things, hopefully good things now. Um, so glad you were all here and joined us for this fun little foray into graphic design and I'm excited to see you off on your own adventures in designing and creating really cool looking things in the future. So thanks for joining me.